And the great thing about the California Island Symposium is that we're able to bring together all these different very bright and dedicated people who are working over um, many different islands and also many different disciplines. And we can start talking about how these different things interact and what are some great collaborations that we could do for better understanding these islands. And are there some species or some ecosystems that are not doing well? And this is a wonderful event in that it's a cross-disciplinary uh, approach to conservation. We're hearing from archaeologists, biologists, botanists, and it's a really incredible experience for us to be able to listen to all of those experts and take from them not just what's happening but also offering us future areas where we really need to be focusing our resources to protect uh, the environment in a, in a rapidly changing world. What's so important about this meeting is that it, uh, it brings researchers together to talk about what they're learning. But I think the other thing it does is it stimulates some new thought is how do we look into the future? Because all these people come together and they start talking about what each is learning and how it builds that story even further. This place is becoming, I think, uh, internationally known as a, as a place of great intrigue, but also a welcoming place to do science. Recently, we've been holding this symposium about every four years and every symposium seems to grow. There's nothing like getting together face to face which is what happens at the symposium. For this ninth symposium, we have over 600 people gathered together who have all different types of interests regarding the islands. And what happens at the islands in some ways also reflects what's happening in the greater world. And so the, the California Island Symposium is a great time for us to sit back and to look at that, that bigger world and to talk with scientists who are researching what's going on and can help us understand um, some of the things that are happening. Welcome back, my friends. I'm Russell Gallupo. I'm the superintendent of Channel Islands National Park. And I say friends because I would tell you in my 35 years of working in the National Park Service, I can't say that I've ever been at a science conference where actually all the ologists get in the room and they all care about each other's work. And my message to all you students is you could just take home one thing from this. It's not just the knowledge of what you're getting from these people, but it's how they work together. I think that is the beauty of Channel Islands and the, the family of scientists, historians, whoever you are that help us manage this great place, it's because you work together in this place we call home. Thank you for doing that. So I had the luxury of introducing our speaker for this morning. And uh, the title for our plenary is a new, a new Geography of Hope, Sliding Baselines, Climate Change, and the Necessity of Protective Places. Dr. Moore contends that in our radically anthropocentric culture, sliding ecological baselines have resulted in sliding moral baselines, sliding baselines of the imagination, and sliding baselines of hope. But she, su she suggests that protected places, parks and refuges, have the power to block all those slides, every one. Because they model a new relationship to the natural world, one marked by restraint, respect, and spiritual and evolutionary kings kinship. Protected places offer hope and the possibility of human and cultural transformation. Dr. Kathleen Dean Moore is a philosopher. She's an environmental advocate and a writer. As a distinguished professor at Oregon State University, she has taught environmental ethics, but her growing alarm at the devastation of the planet led her to leave the university to speak out in defense of the lovely reeling world. Her most recent book, I just happen to have a copy of that right here, The Great Tide Rising, Toward Clarity and Moral Courage in a Time of planet, uh, Planetary Change, follows her other book, Moral Ground, testimony from the world's moral leaders about our obligation to the future. Her award-winning books of nature essays celebrate and explore the meaning of the wet, 
wild world of rivers, islands, and tidal shores, such as river walking, hold fast, Pine Island paradox, wild comfort, and the forthcoming novel, Piano Tide. She writes from Corvallis, Oregon, and from a small cabin where two creeks and a bear trail meet a tidal cove in Alaska. With that, I have the great privilege and honor to introduce to you Dr. Kathleen Dean Moore. Thank you, Russell, and thanks to all of you for coming out so early in the morning. You know, it's wonderful to be here. I came right here last afternoon uh, on the airport shuttle, and I landed into your cocktail reception, uh, what my husband and I call the hour of joy. And, uh, and I thought, yeah, these are my people. <laughs> yeah, this is the kind of place I want to come to. Um, you're not looking quite so chipper this morning. <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry, sorry to say that. Maybe I'll put my glasses on and we'll get that right. Of course, then I went and watched the vice presidential debate and that soured me to everything. Uh, but um, Aldo Leopold said uh, one of the penalties of an ecological education is that one lives alone in a world of wounds. And I thought yesterday afternoon, absolutely not. That is not true. Yes, we live in a wounded world, but we are not alone. We are members of this community of people who are here to do everything they can to heal those wounds. Um, it, it, it makes me very, um, very cognizant of the fact that even as we're falling into bed at night and we're exhausted and we're despondent because we have not yet managed to save the world, the sun is rising on the other side of the planet and other people are rising to the challenge of protecting or creating what's flourishing and beautiful. And on this rotating planet, there's this great dawn chorus of committed people, everybody getting up, rustling up coffee, doing this good work of defending the world's thriving. And I have to say that nowhere do I feel that more strongly than when I come into the midst of people who have devoted their lives to protecting places, their beauty and their functionality and their fullness of life. You are my heroes, and I love to hang out with you. People like you have better parties than anyone else, and I'm so bummed that I'm going to miss your beach party. Um, you, did you ever take that test when you were in high school that told what you were interested in? Yeah, well, I took that, and I was turned out to uh, what I should be, what I was ideally suited to be, was a forest ranger. And I was so excited. And I, I went into philosophy instead of all the benighted and dis <laughs> despondent professions. But uh, your beautiful places, your protected areas, are where I go to regain my sanity. And let's take that seriously, to regain my sanity. You've all heard that wonderful quotation from Wallace Stegner way back in 1960 where he wrote that wilderness, and I would say by extension, all protected places are geographies of hope, by which he meant a means of reassuring ourselves of our sanity as creatures. And I swear to God, if there was ever a time when we needed to reassure ourselves of our sanity of creatures, it would be in this election cycle. At any rate, um, it seems to me that in these protected places, that in these marshes underneath these stony beaches, a person is called to a kind of simplicity, a kind of joy, and a kind of self-restraint. So yes, protected places are a geography of hope, hope for human integrity and good sense. But dear God, I do not have to tell you that Protected places are taking it in the chin now as global warming strengthens its grip on the land. I don't need to tell you that this decade has become a race between the end of the fossil fuel economy and the end of the Cenozoic era. One of those two has to go. And because these protected areas are, are set up to protect the most fragile and most vulnerable ecosystems, it's no surprise that your places are the ones that are being hit hard and fast and first. These places of specialized species, 
these places of island ecologies, these places of high drama and deeply felt significance are going to be the first, of course, to be challenged. So where is the hope in the protected places now, I would ask Wallace Stegner. Where is the hope in these cracked playas that have become the face of climate catastrophe? And where is the hope in these orange needle and beetle killed forests that are facing into a hot wind? Where is the hope in these shrunken, dusty glaciers at the base of raw couloirs? I'm trying to figure this out. So um, I didn't learn your name. What is your name? OK, Kathleen, I can remember that. Can we see the next slide then? So what is the role of national parks and your islands and your near shore protected areas in these years when the ecological baselines are falling so fast that the time has come to be called the sixth extinction? So let's go there, mapping a new geography of hope, sliding baselines, diminished expectations, and the future of protected places. And I implore you to trust me this morning. We have to go to the dark side before we can move back into the light. Can we summon up the courage? So we do need to do that, and I'll spend about half my time setting this up. But then I want to offer a different way to think about this, and I hope that will really cheer you up. If you don't agree with me, it'll probably just make you mad. I'll take that, I'll take that challenge. Okay, so Kathleen. I will argue that it's worse than what Kate imagines, that we are dealing with a sliding ecological baseline, but that that has resulted in a sliding moral baseline and sliding baselines of imagination and finally hope. And then I will argue that protected places, your beloved shorelines, have the power to block them all, all these slides, every one. So let's take them one by one and talk first about the sliding ecological baseline. According to the World Wildlife Fund, since 1970, 40% of everything that has the breath of life, animals and plants, has been erased from the face of the earth. Now I tell my students who don't necessarily remember 1970 that that was the year when John Lennon um, said that the Beatles were dead. That was the year when that Apollo 13 made that spectacular terrifying return to Earth from the moon. Do you remember 1970? If you remember 1970, then you were alive when there are almost twice as many plants and animals and forests and fields as there are now. And if you don't remember 1970, you have spent your whole life in a world that has been recently stripped by almost half an impoverished, simplified, drained, and bulldozed world. I will die in a world that is half as abundantly beautiful as the one I was born into. My children will tear out half the pages in their field guides and throw them away. They will not need them ever again. And my children's grandchildren's picture books about hippopotami and penguins and old albatross will be as fantastical as unicorns. In protected places, it's my understanding, the number of species has remained about the same, but the particular array of species has shifted toward the common place. So what we're seeing in the lands that you're protecting, as you could tell me better than I could tell you, is both the impoverishment and the homogenization of ecosystems. So, Van Gogh's Starry Night. You see me giving you art. Whenever I have to talk about things that break my heart, I move to art. Uh, Frederick Nietzsche said, we have art in order not, not to die of the truth. This is Van Gogh, but it's made out of discarded cigarette lighters. How many people alive today have ever seen any ecosystem in its full and glorious complexity? Most of us lived in a stripped down, dammed up, paved over, desperately impoverished landscape. And over time, this becomes the norm, the way it's always been, the way it has to be, the standard against which we measure gain and loss and gratitude and grief. And this, of course, is what you know very well is the problem of the sliding ecological baseline. It's got three elements. The first one is that you have a simplified ecosystem, one that is damaged and then ransacked and then replaced. 
Secondly, then, you have a collective failure of memory about what once was. But who can see what isn't there? Who can hear the vanished songs? And then, number three, you have the use of this damaged place as the marker of the standard of normal or natural, and suddenly the world slips a notch. Diminished expectation, a shrunken sense of the possible. And this is what we have to resist. This finally coming to accept that a desperately diminished landscape is the norm, the way it's supposed to be, the way it's always been, the way it must always be, as good as it gets. That's the result that we're all afraid of, right? That's the result that we're all pushing back against. And then what happens? Then we have a sliding moral baseline. And notice this, it's not just the landscape that's diminished, it's our valuing of it. An ecological ethic is an ethic that's based on caring, right? And with each diminishment, we care less until we couldn't care at all. Who cares about the diminished and ugly places? Will you care about the oceans once the whales and the penguins are gone? So the result is this sliding moral baseline where we ask so little of ourselves because we're caught up in this astonishing disregard for the quietly vanishing creatures and their landscapes. But who can grieve the loss that they never knew? The measure of our obligation also then slips down another notch. And who's holding the line? Who's holding the line? The environmental movement can tell us what we're against, bless their hearts. But the environmental movement is not doing a good job of telling us what we're for. And worse, we've, we've replaced this ethic of affirmation and um, uh, aspiration for an ethic of regulation. So we think ethics asks the question, how much can I destroy? What lines can I cross before somebody stops me or finds me? And then I figure my corporation has done a good moral job because it hasn't broken any laws. But what I'm hungry for, what I'm hungry for is an ethic of affirmation. What is a thriving ecosystem? I have a dream, I have a vision of a landscape that is complete and complex. You know, Kathleen, go back to that live turtle. I can't watch this very long. So people tell me, you know, that's not right, Kathy. You're forgetting this great leap that we have made, this great moral leap forward that is the Endangered Species Act, which grants animals and plants the sort of right to life, and that that is awesome. Well, it's better than nothing, but awesome? I'd say not so much. Um, the ESA kicks in to protect plants and animals once they're teetering on the edge of extinction. So it's true, as you know, that under the ESA, the lives of plants and animals can sometimes trump, I'm sorry, uh, override. <laughs> it's terrible when people steal perfectly good words. <laughs> it's true that sometimes the ESA can override the economic interests of the people who would destroy the plants and animals. Um, and it certainly can delay economic pro projects and sometimes stop them in their tracks. But I'm not the least bit convinced that the Endangered Species Act honors the rights of plants and animals. I mean, does it respect the rights to life when the government waits to protect a species until the last possible moment before extinction? Or when it saves the least possible portion of habitat? I would submit to you that this supposed moral advance, the Endangered Species Act, is the stingiest, the most miserly and grudging, the most last ditch of all possible ways to respect the natural world. No action can be taken until some agency pronounces the situation calamitous. And in what way does this respect the rights of any but these tattered remnants of the species? And even if the ESA manages to protect the tired, the poor, the wretched refuge of your teeming shore, it doesn't even try to protect the huddled masses. And so what of the great herds of buffalo? And what about the loping wolf packs? What about these swirling masses of trumpeter swans and migrating hawks and monarch butterflies by the millions and schools of silver salmon? This great abundance of life, this wonder of their numbers. The point is that we eat away 
and we eat away and we eat away at species until they are almost gone and then we congratulate ourselves for being enlightened for saving the stragglers i'd say pa so skip forward two now so we get to the forest okay and so we come to almost unnoticed the sliding baseline of the imagination because who can imagine a healthy ecosystem who lives in a landscape of loss and no longer notices? And even our sense of possibility has been strip mined. The sliding baseline of the imagination. I've watched children play on my own Oregon coast, and I've written about it in my book, Hold Fast. Here's what I said. I said, these children know mostly fish poor, flood stripped streams. Here, all estuaries are fouled, and no river water is safe to drink. That's the way it is. Why should they think it's any different? Children who've never seen an ancient forest climb the huge, crumbling, blood red stumps as they might climb onto the lap of a vacant faced grandfather. They look out over the ferns and hemlock seedings, unable to imagine what used to be. And then, Another opening in the universe slams shut. Another set of possibilities disappears forever. And get this, on the airplane coming here, there was a child who was um, dying of cancer, who was on one of those make-a-wish expeditions. Not knowing real rivers, his dying wish was to run the water slide at Disneyland. I wanted to take that child home with me and help him go down the Rogue River and see what a real river was like. And not knowing fields of wildflowers, a child might bring back a uh, bouquet of dandelions for her mother on a planet that once held 30,000 species of orchids. The simplification and homogenization of the imagination. One rabbit, one tree, and a rainbow. Dear God. And the simplified landscape is all the more impossible to bear when you start to marvel or stop to marvel at the extraordinary chance that we find ourselves in the Cenozoic era when evolution has achieved its greatest fullness of flowering. What the theologian Thomas Berry called the most lyric period in earth history. And we imagine our great fortune to live in the time of thrush song and wolf choruses, in the time of microscopic sea angels with tiny wings and whales that teach each other to sing. Thomas Berry also said, it's our generation that's witnessing the end of the era that we evolved in. My generation has done what no previous generation could do because they lack the technological power and what no future generation will be able to do because the planet will never again be so beautiful or abundant. Which brings us finally to the sliding baseline of hope. At the end of the Cretaceous, 66 million years ago, maybe 80%, you tell me, 80% of the species vanished. Most of the dinosaurs, many of the small creatures of the seas. Is it even possible to imagine that we are living through an extinction event of equal power? In the last 40 years, 39% of terrestrial wildlife gone, 39% of marine wildlife gone, 76% of freshwater wildlife gone in our lifetimes. And of course, the greatest extinctions are in the poor countries where the wealthy countries are exporting their environmental destruction. We know the cause. You just lift your eyes to these very hills, just walk out the door. Deforestation, a dramatic loss of habitat, over-harvesting of the oceans, poisoning of land and air, suburbs, shopping malls, Marriott hotels. And what causes that? A way of life, a constantly growing, all-consuming culture driven by extractive industries that have few legal or moral constraints. It is madness, the choices we have decided to make. We trade forests for uselessly large homes. We trade albatross for plastic six-pack rings. We trade Singing Marsh for another Kmart parking lot. It's madness, this consumption, this eating up. And get this. We trade rhinoceros horn for male sexual potency. We trade bear spleens for male sexual potency. 
We trade Tibetan red deer for sexual potency. What is this overriding need? And what are we thinking? For corn to burn in our cars, we're happy to give up monarch butterflies. I could go on and on. It's a frenzied, mad auction of what is of ancient value for what is cheap and desperately sad. It's a mad rush to the end of the world. When these things are gone, they are irretrievable. So what can we hope for now? Sliding baselines. Maybe it's worse than that. Maybe there's no such thing as a baseline anymore. Maybe we are witness to the disappearance of the baseline, the extinction of the normal. Is this the new normal that we may never see normal again? So in the midst of this, Jonathan Jarvis, the parks director, you probably know him. He says, we have to give up the old mandate to preserve each park as a vignette of primitive America. That doesn't exist anymore. Imagine him saying that. That doesn't exist anymore. It never will again. Instead, quoting, we must steward America's treasures through the continuous and unpredictable changes to come. Oh my God, what a responsibility you all face. And I, living at this hinge point in history, I wouldn't have chosen it, honestly, would you? I mean, would you have chosen this responsibility? I've always thought, if I had a choice, I would choose to live somewhere between the advent of modern dentistry and nuclear weapons. But here we are. You could drive a nail through this decade and all of history would swing in the balance. All these years, we human beings have been lifted by the assurance that birds would come and they would return that the storms would come in season and storms would blow out to sea again, that fish would scatter eggs before they died. Remember, the music of the world was a repeating promise. It was a promise that harmony would be restored again and again in chords so complicated and beautiful that we could love them even if we couldn't understand them fully. In Oregon, the first rufous hummingbirds returned in late February when the blueberries bloomed on the coast and the violet green swallows returned to the ponds in early March to meet the mayflies. And it was a great day in the swamps in early April. You could count on it when the American bitterns and the yellow-headed blackbirds swooped in grumping and hollering. We lived and died by this, didn't we? We lived and died by this faith in inevitable unfolding harmony the expectation and the arrival, the call and the response, the question and the answer, the world's promise of absolution and return. But the weather comes now and goes, and who can make sense of it? Last year, drought dried the grass fields where insects and mice would have grown abundant, and the peregrine falcons, you know this, this is your country, skinny or starved produce no, rig, no young. And last year, the swallows came back to Oregon before winter was finished, and there were no insects in the wind. I have seen a starved swallow. Its wing was frozen to the sand. Question, what stands against this? What stands against each of these sliding baselines? God bless you, that would be you. Because protected places are the very few places where all four sliding baselines are blocked. So this is your work, for which I am deeply grateful. This is what you do every day to create this new geography of hope. So there's nothing to do but to reimagine the ways in which protected places, parks, can provide us with this new geography of hope. To think in new ways about the reasons why protected places, your parks, your protected areas, the cultural sites, are profoundly sane on a planet that's reeling under a pathology of greed and short-sightedness, short, short fingers. I want to say, <laughs> sorry, you can't help it. I want to say that even if it's wounded, even if the landscape is wounded, the protective landscape draws the line. And quite a line that is between what is protected and what is without protection from the industrialized growth economy's war against the world. What is this work and why does it matter? 
So let's talk first about the sliding ecological baseline and make the claim that protected areas stop the harm. Like a fence, the boundaries of a wilderness area or a park or refuge or protected place contain a landscape. But equally important, they exclude a landscape. A park is a testimony to the human will to say, no, the industrialized growth economy will not cross this line. No, reckless disdain for the natural world has no place here. Here, the landscape is valued in itself for its own sake, not for the profit that might be wrung from it. Fracking pads must stop short of this Red Rock Canyon. Oil wells must stop short of this chain of islands. Water sucking mines must stop short of this desert spring. Cattle have to find a different place to blow and belch. So a protected place echoes with moral principle. It echoes with the moral affirmation that there are business plans that are destructive and cruel and they will not do business here. And then, inside the line, there's a vision of what a desert or a marshland or an island can be if we don't wreck it, for God's sake, if we allow it to grow to its full beauty and ecological richness. And so protected places are proof of the possibility of human restraint. This is not a small thing. The protected place becomes a place of human transformation. And so we come to the sliding moral baseline. There are places you can go on God's great earth where you have little choice but to be your best self. And these are the parks and the protected places. It's simply against the law to be a greedy, reckless pig in a park. It's simply against the law to steal or vandalize whatever you want from a restored saltwater marsh. So the sojourner is called to a kind of self-restraint that is rare in life. They are called to a generosity of spirit that only takes what's given and returns it in gratitude and care. This is a fact of great importance. Practice being a good human being in a protected area is proof that human beings are capable of being good and decent citizens of the earth. The surprise to me is that when human beings cross the boundary into a park, when they come onto your islands, they have the ability to slip from one level of being into another. They have the ability to be um, transformed from people who are surrounded and obsessed and dependent on multitudes of stuff to being the kind of people whose greatest pleasures are simplicity and a close connection to something greater than they are, something wiser, wetter, more powerful. If there is not hope in the transmutability of human character, then I don't know where we'll find it. You, in other words, bring out the best in people. You stand up and you witness, in David Foreman's words, we, of course, he says, have an obligation to wild things of all species, today and tomorrow, to honor their intrinsic value, and thus to act in ways that keep whole the beauty, integrity, and stability of the earth. Protected places, people say, are saying the way people are saying all around the world. They're standing up as the parks are standing up and saying, not another mountaintop, not here. Not another rainforest. Not another estuary, not another prairie, or not another mighty river will be traded away for cash. These are not industries to take or sell. They belong to the future of the everlasting earth. Now, there's also no doubt, while we're talking about stands, that geographical worth of wilderness is overwhelming in a time of climate change. The places that you're protecting, the places that you're restoring, and the desperate hope is that these healthy forests, healthy ecosystems, healthy soils can sequester carbon as fast as humankind can pour carbon dioxide into the air. And so obviously, the more healthy ecosystems there are, the better the chance. So the more intact wilderness, the more tangled bank, the more heavily breathing forests, the more growing jungles, the more tundra, the more healthy island ecosystems are present on the planet, 
the more carbon dioxide they will suck from the air. So to the extent that pr protected areas save intact ecosystems, they save carbon sinks, they are part of the great hope of the reeling world. I believe that a sane policy on parks would not ask, is it pristine and therefore worthy of being saved? Is it untrammeled? But asking instead only, can it breathe? If it can breathe, we have to save it. So we protect, we restore, we grow, we preserve, we hold on to what we've got, and this is your work, and I am so happy for you and glad for you. Noah, Noah knew that whatever survived the great flood would repopulate the world, the lions and the elephants two by two. And you know that whatever species make it through this narrow hourglass of our time, that's what the world will be made of. What you save is what the world will be made of. Noah protested, remember this? He says, I'm old, I'm tired. Why me, oh Lord? <laughs> the answer is, it's got to be everybody. Each person asking, what ark can I build? What habitat can I save or create that will carry living things? That switch then takes us to the baseline of the imagination. I submit to you that our problem as a culture, our problem as a world culture of extractive industry, isn't with how to do renewable energy. It isn't do, to do with how to farm fish or these increasingly desperate ways to save our way of life. The problem is our way of life itself. And a culture, I submit to you, that prides itself on accumulating wealth instead of sharing it, look out the door that a culture that gobbles up the fecundity of the planet instead of nurturing it, an economy that eats its own children, any economy of infinite extraction will kill off the sources of its sustenance. So our work is not to find ways to save this way of life. Our work is to save the sustaining world from this way of life's destructive power. And so the challenge is to invent new life ways of respect and restraint that work with rather than against the living, thriving Earth. That's what you are modeling in the parks. So we need to reimagine the place in the for those protected areas in this reeling, squeaking world. And we need to flip our understanding in a great paradigm shift. So it occurred to me, you know, this, this paradigm shift where the old ways meet up against the new ways, a new way of understanding our place in the natural world, happened to me quite abruptly in the, the Galapagos Island. And I have um, written about that, and I want to read you just two paragraphs from that experience of what it's like to live in a world that is flipped, where I'm not claiming to be the king of the universe, but a member of this community, this kinship of living things. As for me, I know my place here. I mean this figuratively and literally. I have put, been put in my place here among the wheeling lives. It is quite a small place beside a white post, which is the only place on this island I am allowed to sit. If I venture too close to a nest, a quick peck from a booby will remove a divot from my calf, and a park ranger will gently admonish me, stay on trail, please. I am not in charge here. I have no right to rummage around or take so much as a pebble. The animals will allow me to sit quietly for a short time, but the rights holders in this place are the shearwaters, the marine iguanas, the baby sea lions. In this place, I am required to show respect. Talking baby talk to the animals or demeaning them in any other way is expressly forbidden. Under ordinary circumstances, I would resent being relegated without a vote to subsidiary status. I'm an adult homo sapiens for God's sake, the pinnacle of creation, and I'm not used to animals using me and showing me this complete disregard. Before the day is out, a booby will rock right over my feet and never even care. In the Galapagos National Park of Ecuador, the animals are free to do as they please. I have to follow strict rules for their benefit or be banished, while their rights to enjoy life and liberty and to pursue happiness in their own lunatic ways are absolute. I've always wondered what it would be like to live in a world that was flipped on its head. 
If our species had no rights, while other species had the right to walk all over us without regard or consequence, now I know it makes me strangely happy. If there is a better way, it will be the parks that help us imagine it. A week in the wilderness near my home is a chance to recreate myself. And this is why I like to go there. It's a chance for me to express, to live out my deepest values and to practice being the person I want to be. The freedom of protected places is not the freedom to do anything I want. It's the opposite. Here in the protected places, that's what protection means. Here in the protected places, I am free to restrain myself by my own sense of right and wrong and to go AWOL finally for a brief period from the industrial growth economy's war against the world. So here is our time in this movement of time when one set of stories, one worldview about who we are, grinds up another way, uh, up against another story. We live in a time of paradigm change. It's unstable. It's dangerous. It always is. A time of paradigm change is always dangerous, always challenging. Things fall apart. The center doesn't hold. The facts that we encounter in one life do not fit with what we believe is true. And who can make sense of the tectonic trembling in the world that we live in? And when the old way feels the ground slipping out from under it, it struggles more and more violently for control. We see this when the oil industry, when the extractive capitalist feels the ground slipping away. It struggles, struggles. It makes its old stories bigger. It makes their stories more complicated and more insistent to account for discordant facts, even as its foundation shakes. It's a profoundly insecure time. It is a time of bullies. We should not be surprised to find this in our work because you all are representing the new story. And something happens. You know, in a paradigm shift, the old story falls apart and the new story emerges to take its place. No one knows where this begins. In Copernicus's workshop in Poland, in Selma, Alabama, in Tiananmen Square, at the Berlin Wall, and I submit to you in the national parks and protected places of the United States. I think that might be so. The story that you are representing on the land is a story about the way the world actually works. It's a story that validates what we most deeply value, and it answers the human yearning for connection to one another and to the astonishing earth and to the ongoing future. In many ways, what you're doing on the land is an ecological and ethical account of human kinship with a land that is interconnected and interdependent and finite and resilient and beautiful. And like any worldview, it provides a measure of what is sensible and good. So what is, in a few short sentences, what is the world view that protected places embody? Because we understand that the world's systems and beings are interconnected, we realize that all flourishing is mutual and that damage to any part is damage to the whole. That's the foundation of justice. Because we understand that the world is interdependent, we gratefully acknowledge our dependence on one another and on the life-giving systems of the earth. That is the foundation of compassion. Because we recognize that the earth is finite, we embrace an ethic of restraint and precaution to replace a destructive ethos of excess. This is the foundation of prudence. Because the earth is beautiful, we refuse to be made into foot soldiers in the oil industry's wars against the earth. This is the beginning of moral courage. And because we understand the planet's systems are resilient, we are called to take every possible step to stop the harm and undo the damage that we have done. This is the foundation of hope. In these times that seem rootless and grim, and when even the ground gives way under our feet, I will enter this new geography of hope every time I enter into the one of the places that you protect. And I know that even though many of the plants and animals are gone from your places, what remains 
is a wilderness of sinewy, raw-born possibility. Just that. You hold the possibility of the future in your hands. Possibility, the creative urgency of this life unfurling in the dark folds of the land, the fertility of the human imagination, and the expansive embrace of the human heart. You are protecting the home of hope. So let me close with a passage from Clarissa Estes Pinkham. As you surely understand my gratitude to you, which is overwhelming. She says, do not lose heart. We were made for these times. Yes, for years we have been learning, practicing, been in training for, and just waiting to meet on this exact plane of engagement. I recognize a seaworthy vessel when I see one. There have never been more able vessels in the water than there are right now across the world. And they are fully provisioned and able to signal one another as never before in the history of humankind. There will always be times when you feel discouraged. I, too, have felt despair many times in my life. But I do not keep a chair for it. I will not entertain it. It is not allowed to eat from my plate. I hope you will write this on your wall. When a great ship is in harbor and moored, it is safe. There can be no doubt. But that is not what great ships are built for. Thank you. Thank you for your work.